The Incredible Hulk TV series ended in 1982, and that was it for the Hulk. That was until a trio of late 1980s TV movies brought back actors Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno for a few more adventures of shirt-ripping, villain-bobbing action. Honestly, if they weren't sponsored by The Gap, then they really missed a trick. The Incredible Hulk Returns, Trial of the Incredible Hulk, and spoilers, The Death of the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> Now I have a mutation near the rage center of my brain. And during moments of anger or fear, it secretes a hormone and I become a mutant thing. Over five seasons, David Banner never found his cure for hulking out. The Incredible Hulk television series ended as most episodes did, with David Banner walking off with the saddest theme song ever playing on the soundtrack. Of course, if David Banner had ever found his cure, that would have been the end of the show there and then. Instead, CBS just upped and cancelled it in 1982. New World Pictures was originally formed by B-movie producer Roger Corman and later owners of the company went on something of a buying spree in the 1980s. We're not talking three pairs of jeans and some Reeboks, but a number of companies, often ones in a difficult financial position. One of their acquisitions was Marvel Comics, and as such, its New World International division wanted to put their newfound IP to good use. Well, they wanted to put their IP to some use. By just letting loose. Some things, Maggie, you can't just let loose. In 1988, The Incredible Hulk Returns was broadcast by NBC, and as it did what it said on the tin, people were excited. Since the end of the series, Bill Bixby had gradually moved away from acting, and by the late 80s had found a lot of work as a TV director. For the Hulk reunion movies, it would be Bixby's own production company charged with getting the show made. <laughs> Bixby would of course be back playing the lead, the tortured soul of Dr. David Banner, a guy who can't get a break from all of this Hulk shit. I don't know why you're not using your real name or why you want people to think you're dead and I don't care. Well, that's not true really. I'm curious as hell. Over the years, Banner has gone through many pairs of shirts and boots, but somehow not trousers. Apparently the idea of wearing a tracksuit never once occurred to him. While a number of people involved in the original series came back for the TV movies, series created Kenneth Johnson was conspicuous by his absence, and his deft touch is somewhat missed. Of course, if you call something the Incredible Hulk, then you better bloody well have the actual Hulk. So Lou Ferrigno returns as the titular green rage monster. Odin's beard. For an ugly troll, you're a fighter. He's the Hulk, or his Hulkness, or Hulker, or El Hulkarino, if you're not into the whole brevity thing. Also returning in this first movie, Jack Colvin as a weirdly comedic Jack McGee. Less a bogeyman threatening to end David Banner's search for a cure, and more like a mosquito in your bedroom on a hot night. David Banner is living under another assumed identity identity, this time working in a facility where he's been developing some technology that might be beneficial to him, a something-something transponder that could also be used as a weapon. It's been two years since Banner's last Hulk out. Everything's been quite hulky-dory, and he's keen to rid himself of this hulking alter ego for good in order to begin the new life with his new lady friend. Shh, no one tell her what happened to the others. Of course, his work on the Something Something Transponder has attracted interest in its use as a weapon and some no good nicks led by Tim Thomason and Charles Napier are ready to kill in order to steal it. Of course, there's another wrinkle in Banner's plan. You are David Banner, aren't you? An old acquaintance has tracked down Banner, apparently using the app Find My Hulk. Donald Blake had been on an archaeological dig where he found a hammer, which brought with it a new bestie, Thor. Blake can summon Thor by shouting at the top of his lungs and the Viking warrior slash fratboy will just appear. Thor just wants to fight for a good cause and when that's done, he just wants to drink and make merry with women. I want a drink. Thor quickly, actually no, this scene really does drag on for far too long, but Thor does find his feet in our world by hanging out in a biker bar. He also hopes to fight again alongside Banner's troll friend. You're basically a, a good dude, dude. A nice guy who just happens to enjoy pounding evildoers into oblivion. Banner, having fallen off his no-hulk wagon, doesn't want to fight, but he really has no choice when his girlfriend is threatened. Well, after you turn yourself into that green troll, of course, I don't do that deliberately. 
The Incredible Hulk Returns was written and directed by Hulk series writer Nicholas Correa, but it has a distinctly low budget feel. Like a lot of late 80s genre programming made in the US, Hulk was shot on film, but post-production was carried out on videotape, meaning these movies will never look as nice as shows made completely on film. The movie also falls apart towards the end, with the action looking somewhat amateurish compared to the series. It's like you gave some bored kids a camcorder and some Halloween costumes and told them to make Make a 90 minute movie in five days. It is fun to see Hulk and Thor together, though it's not quite Thor Ragnarok on a TV budget. And I need to drink. Perhaps we need to have a serious conversation about this version of Thor's alcohol dependency issues. Donald Blake is obviously an enabler because Thor obviously likes to get on the piss and get completely hammered. Okay, big boy, do your stuff. Thor's backstory here isn't explored in any great depth, though it has changed somewhat from the comic book version. Bill Bixby is of course brilliant, and Ferrigno still has that famous rig. Times have changed though, and the Hulk having a hairdo that looks like it's borrowed from Joanna Lumley won't cut it anymore, so Hulk now sports an era-appropriate mullet. The Hulk's hair was always difficult to get right, though his wig and makeup on these movies isn't always done all that well. Eric Kramer as Thor and Steve Levitt as Donald Blake are two that could work well in a buddy comedy action series, which was kind of the point. Thor getting so much screen time in this is no surprise, since this was in essence a way to use Hulk's popularity to pilot a potential Thor series. Poor NBC, you wanted a Hulk movie and you got a half Hulk with a Thor pilot thrown in. Remember when you saw that ad for 250 business cards for 10 bucks, but by the time you got through the checkout, you'd already gotten 1,000 cards with gold to leaf printing, two dozen posters, and 50 rolls of custom three ply toilet paper with your phone number printed on every sheet. It's a joke. Needless to say, a Thor series wasn't picked up at the time. The pairing of Donald Blake and Thor on television might have been alright, but there's not really enough here that would warrant a further adventure. In general, the movie is so by the numbers, you could use it to generate your next lottery entry. Thor only happens when you call him up, and that's the rock bottom truth of it. I have no choice. The creature in me is uncontrollable, but you control Thor. Now, there must be a reason for that. Incredible Hulk returns rated rather better than they were expecting, and so another Hulk film was put into production, this time directed by Bill Bixby and now filmed in the Hollywood of the North, Vancouver, literally jamming it with the sun don't shine. Just to feel the sun. Trial of the Incredible Hulk first screened in 1989 and featured Banner teaming up with another Marvel hero in another backdoor pilot. Banner intervenes in an incident where two thugs harass a woman, which inevitably results in a Hulk out. But as the thugs are connected to the town's crime lord, the victim is intimidated into pointing the finger at David Banner. They think I'm responsible. Now in jail, Banner is offered the services of a blind attorney, Matt Murdock, who thinks Banner can help him take down the town's big bad. By night, Murdoch moonlights as the crime fighter Daredevil. Be very good. Read a book. Looking for evidence against the town's top crime boss, Kingpin. Daredevil will come after her. And then we will have it. Murdoch teams up with a still reluctant David Banner to free a hostage and take down Kingpin. Of course, Kingpin escapes with the promise of returning in future adventures. John Rhys Davies as Kingpin was an interesting take, even if he's not remotely recognisable as the iconic villain. I believe he's the only Marvel villain to show up in a Hulk TV project. At the same time, he could have been any gangster. <laughs> Filming in Canada, you have to really feel for Lou Ferrigno having to run around in what looks like fairly cold weather. Answer the question! You must answer the question! Answer, answer, the, answer question. the question! Answer it, Dave! We will answer the question! The best scene is Banner on trial being badgered by lawyers, which of course sees the Hulk wreck the courtroom. Stanley appears as one of the jurors in one of his earliest cameos. Of course, the scene turns out to be a dream sequence. Banner is terrified of hulking out in public possibly because he has a giant zit from an ingrown hair on his lower back, which grows to five times its usual size and sprouts teeth during a Hulk out. So sad. Trial of the Incredible Hulk is a much better finished product, with the proceedings looking a little more polished and, and consequently less cheap for the most part. 
Rex Smith, former star of the short-lived 80s series Street Hawk, might have been good to watch as Matt Murdock in a Daredevil series, but like Salt Reduced Tears, it just wasn't meant to be. Ratings were good while reviews were not amazing. Eh, I liked it more than the first movie. However, the titular Hulk is nowhere to be seen in the latter part of the film, and there's no actual trial in the movie, unless it's a metaphorical trial with Banner's attempts to stay loosey-goosey and not Hulk out at the slightest provocation. That's probably overthinking it. The lack of an actual trial of the Incredible Hulk in a film called Trial of the Incredible Hulk it did annoy more than a few people. No, I'm going to start using my skills as a scientist and a doctor. A third movie was made for broadcast in 1990, The Death of the Incredible Hulk. Yes. David is working as a janitor at a heavily guarded research facility, but he's pretending to be simple so that he can sneak into the lab of Dr. Pratt at night and work on his own uh, problem. Meanwhile, an enemy spy type is cajoling one of his operatives, Yasmin, into breaking into the same lab and stealing Pratt's research. David is discovered, and after Banner recounts his tortured journey, Dr. Pratt begs Banner to work together to find a cure. I still say it's human, David. It's part of you. Of course, at this point, Yasmin breaks in and puts the kibosh on all of this. Pratt is injured and comatose. Yasmin's minder reveals that Yasmin's sister is not a hostage, but in fact their boss. And one thing leads to another, and Yasmin and Banner end up as a couple, preparing to go off together when they learn Pratt has been abducted by Yasmin's sister. In securing Pratt's release, Hulk destroys a plane carrying the escaping villains, and things ain't looking so hulky dory anymore. Hulk and David apparently die. I mean, the title of the film was a sort of a giveaway. David, don't. Don't die. Usually you don't give away the ending of a movie in the title. That's why it's called King Kong and not Giant Ape Falls Off Building. Ah, uh, spoilers. The spy antics were a little over the top for a Hulk story, but all in all, this is the most grounded of the three movies, concentrating as it does on David Banner getting a chance at freedom and, failing that, a chance at love. It's never spoken out loud. It's possible Banner's lady love secretly wants him to Hulk out at just the right moment. That's because he's a Hulker Hulker burning love. The third film was again filmed in Vancouver and helmed by Bixby. And this is probably the tightest production of the three films. It easily has the best action sequences. Elizabeth Grayson would later star in the Highlander spin-off series The Raven, and Andreas Katsoulis is perhaps best known for appearing in Babylon 5. There was originally the intention to introduce She-Hulk in this story, but the lack of other Marvel characters meant we could actually have a Hulk movie that was about the Hulk rather than pilots for Walmart, Thor, and dance recital Devil. The late 80s synth score doesn't really fit a Hulk story, but thankfully Joe Harnell's theme tune, The Lonely Man, closes out each of these movies. <laughs> Ratings were not great, and plans for a fourth movie called Revenge of the Incredible Hulk were shelved. Farewell. The idea was Banner would be back, but not able to Hulk out, at least not initially. Unlike the comics, Hulk never managed to speak in the series or the TV movies. Perhaps if there had been further movies, he may have been able to bark out a few words and perhaps fulfil his greatest desire and record an audio commentary for his favourite movie, Ready Player One. Back to future car, ha ha ha. Look, Galactica, ha ha ha. Oh no, The Shining. Hulk shit bats. Hulk always shit bats. For years. I have tried to control him. There would be one more Hulk project reuniting Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno. In the unfinished She-Hulk TV movie that was cancelled after a few days of filming because the network did not think that the actor cast as Jennifer Walters, Mitzi Capture, would have been able to anchor a series on her own. There was also an attempt to make a mid-90s feature starring Bridget Nielsen as She-Hulk that also stalled and it would be 2022 before a live-action She-Hulk project was finally released. May I drive it? Of course. The Incredible Hulk is fairly unusual for a series of the 70s and 80s in that it was eventually given a chance to wrap up the storyline and, of course, the way it did was just like the rest of the series, poignant and tragic. These telemovies are an interesting last chapter to the brilliant Hulk TV series, though at times they can be let down by some elements of cheapness in their production. 
With Bill Bixby's premature death in 1993, these three films at least provided a sense of closure to the journey of a man who was just trying to cure or treat his condition, but instead he spent much of his time helping others. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.